If you've got your Bible, I'm going to read to you this morning, first of all, from the book of Isaiah, chapter 27. Over a number of weeks, we've been looking into this prophecy of Isaiah, and he is writing about how that the life of Israel and Judah has begun to disintegrate because the people essentially have turned away from God. And as a result, God is going to bring judgment and chastisement that is not designed to obliterate them, but to correct them and bring them back on track. And I want to read from two chapters of Isaiah this morning. First in chapter 27, and then in chapter 5, where we have Isaiah singing a song, which he begins in chapter 5, and then it goes underground for about 22 chapters and reappears in chapter 27. Let me read it to you. Isaiah 27, I'm going to read verse 2 and verse 3. In that day, sing about a fruitful vineyard. I, the Lord, watch over it. I water it continually. I guard it day and night so that no one may harm it. Now let me take you back to Isaiah chapter 5. And this is where he began that song about a vineyard. Isaiah 5, I'll read the first seven verses. I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. Now you dwellers in Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. As for what more could I have done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? Now I will tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge and it will be destroyed. I'll break down its wall and it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland, neither pruned nor cultivated, and briars and thorns will grow there. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are the garden of his delight. And he looked for justice, but saw bloodshed, for righteousness, but heard cries of distress. Now these two songs about a vineyard begin in chapter 5, where... My loved one, he says, had a vineyard. We'll, we'll see who that is in just a moment. He placed it in a fertile place on a hillside. The ground was cleared. It was planted with the best of vines. And in anticipation of a good harvest, the farmer made a wine press whereby the grapes could be crushed and made into wine. And then he looked for a harvest of good grapes, but in verse 2, it yielded only bad fruit. This picture in chapter 5 ends in failure. In chapter 27, he looks ahead to that day. And on that day, he talks about a vineyard that is protected watched over, it is watered, it is guarded, and it is called a fruitful vineyard. So in chapter 5, there's no fruit. It is unsuccessful. In chapter 27, there is fruit, and it is thereby successful. I want to look at this picture. It was a song, actually, in both cases that Isaiah sang. The image of a vineyard in the Bible is an important one. Many of you know there are many metaphors in Scripture that 
with their repeated use, consistently depict certain things. If I asked you what oil is a metaphor of, many of you know it is a picture of the Holy Spirit. It is used to depict the presence and working of the Holy Spirit. If I asked you what a flock, a flock of sheep, is a metaphor of in Scripture, you'd recognize it is the people of God. Israel in the Old Testament, the church in the New Testament, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. He talks about his sheep. If I asked you what the metaphor of feasting was about in Scripture, it's about fellowship, friendship, communion, intimacy with one another, either with God, in some instances, I'll come in, I'll eat with you, and you with me, it's fellowship with God, or with one another. This metaphor of the vineyard, and within the vineyard, the metaphor of the vine throughout the Old and the New Testament presents to us a consistent picture. Let me give you some of the images that are in this fruitful vineyard. First of all, the vineyard owner is God himself. Psalm 80, Asaph, who wrote some of the Psalms, talks in this way. He says to God, you brought a vine out of Egypt. You drove other nations and you planted it. You cleared the ground for it and the vine took root and filled the land. You did that, he says. God is the vineyard owner, metaphorically there. As the owner, he's also the vine dresser. He's the husbandman. He's the gardener. Here in chapter 5 and verse 2, he dug it. He cleared it of stones. He planted it with the choicest of vines. In Isaiah 27, he says, I, the Lord, watch over it. I water it continually. I guard it day and night that no harm may come to it. So here's the picture of God, not only as the owner, but as the vine dresser, the gardener, the one looking after the vine and preparing it uh, for its fruitfulness. The vineyard itself is the people of Israel. Again, here in verse 7 of chapter 5, the vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are the garden of my delight. There are several other passages that speak of Israel being the vineyard. Hosea speaks of Israel as a spreading vine, etc. And this picture is used in the Psalms, it's used in Isaiah, in Jeremiah, in Ezekiel, in Hosea, and in the New Testament, Jesus tells several parables about a vineyard, and all these parables about Israel being the vineyard, and then various things happen, but Israel is the vineyard. Then in the New Testament, Within the vineyard itself, there is a true vine, and that is a picture of Christ. Because Jesus said in John 15, I am the true vine. So this picture now comes down to a focus on the true vine. And on the vine, the fourth metaphor is that the branches of that vine are believers. I am the vine, said Jesus in John 15, verse 5, and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear fruit. Now, that's the picture that is given throughout the scriptures of this metaphor of, of the vineyard. So, put it simply, the picture moves from God planted it, who is the owner of the vineyard, to Israel, corporately the vineyard, to Christ. It narrows down to this true vine within the vineyard and then down to the branches on this vine, which are Christian believers. We, therefore, are implicated in this metaphor and in the story that surrounds it. This is not just a historical picture of Israel being the vineyard and okay, so what kind of thing. But as all the uh, promises of the Old Testament find their fulfillment in the New Testament and particularly in Christ, these metaphors come to a picture where you and I are implicated and involved in this. This is about producing fruit. And therefore, this is about your life and my life and how fruitful they may be or fruitful they may not be because both scenarios 
are given to us here. Now, I want to look at this in three simple ways. I want to talk about the purpose of the vineyard, first of all. And the purpose of the vineyard is fruitfulness. That's pretty obvious. Ask any farmer, why do you sow corn? Because he wants results. He wants a harvest. Why do you plant an apple tree? Because he wants apples, of course. And so as chapter 5, verse 2 says, that having prepared the ground and planted the, the grapes, the, the, the vines, he looked for a crop of good grapes because that would be his expectancy. That's what vineyards are for. Chapter 27, sing about a fruitful vine. That's his object. That's what it's for. But as verse 2 says, he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. In other words, something was wrong. Now he asks the question, this is now God speaking. Having described how he had prepared the vineyard on a fertile hillside, dug it up, cleared it of stones, planted the choicest of vines, built a watchtower to overlook it, built a wine press to process the grapes into wine, having done everything that the farmer could have done, but discovered there was no fruit, he then asked the question in verse 4, what more could have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? What's the problem? God asks the question back to Israel. Why do I not bear fruit? Why do you not bear fruit? Why sometimes we find we're living our lives on a treadmill, going nowhere, accomplishing little, and, and very little seems to flow out of our lives that seems to give benefit and blessing to those around us. So what is the nature of the fruit? Well, he describes what the bad fruit is in verse 7 where having said that the vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the house of Israel and the men of Judah are the garden of his delight, this is my vineyard, and he looked for justice but saw bloodshed and looked for righteousness but heard cries of distress. What God was looking for as fruit in Israel was evidence of his own character and goodness and justice and righteousness and holiness. This was the fruit he was looking for. Remember, God had set the nation apart for himself. That's the first thing he says about setting this nation apart. And having set you apart for myself, thought you come to me and you embrace by me and you live in fellowship with me and you live in dependence on me and you live in obedience to me, out of that there will be qualities of character, justice, righteousness that are qualities of God. So the fruit is not there. And the reason why the fruit is not there, he says in verse 12, they have no regard for the deeds of the Lord, no respect for the work of his hands. You see, they've become detached from God himself. That's why there is not the fruit. Isaiah 1 verse 4 is a verse I think is something of a defining verse of what Isaiah's message is about. He says there, they have forsaken the Lord, they have spurned the Holy One of Israel, and turned their backs on him. What had happened to Israel was that they had learned to live apart from God, not on dependence on him, not in obedience to him, not in fellowship with him. And so the words used, they did not regard him, they forsook him, they spurned him, they turned their backs 
on him and as a result they do not have the wherewithal now to produce fruit because that fruit is going to flow out from their relationship with God himself, their union with God himself. You see, their behavior, their justice, their righteousness, their holiness that should have been evident in Israel had its source in the relationship with God. The breaking of the source, their relationship with God, means the breakdown of their character, as is true for you and as is true for me. Because the metaphor that Jesus uses of the vine in John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit apart from me. You can do nothing. This fruit will derive from your relationship with me, your union with me, said Jesus. We are in him. That is our position. We've entered into all that he has accomplished. As I said the other week, Union with Christ means that we are in him, which means we entered into his history. All that's true of Christ has become true of us. And Christ in us means he has entered into our present. And so we are in him. That's our position. He is in us. That's our power. And if you stay in me, if you keep yourself locked into me, he said, you will bear fruit. And your union with me will derive from your love for me, your dependence on me, your obedience to me. Those are the three essentials in our relationship with God, that we love him and we take time listening to him and spending time with him and sensing his love for us, that we obey him, that we depend on him as our strength and as our resources. So the fruitlessness of Israel had its roots in the fact that they had turned away from God. They were still his chosen people. He would still relentlessly bring about his ultimate purpose for Israel, which was to bring the seed of Abraham, which was Christ, the Messiah, into the world, by which all the nations of the world be blessed. So they were his people, and they would remain his people, but they're out of fellowship with him. They're following their own agendas, not his. And the consequence is, though he did everything to make that vineyard suitable and fruitful. When he looked for fruit, there was only bad fruit. I've been reading up a little bit on vineyards and vines this week. I want to read you something that I found on the internet about vineyards and why this man put his vineyard onto a fertile hillside, as chapter 5, verse 1 says. I'll read it to you. Vineyards are often on hillsides and on soil of marginal value to other plants. A common saying is that the worse the soil, the better the wine. Planting on hillsides, especially those facing north in the southern hemisphere or south in the northern hemisphere, is most often in an attempt to maximize the amount of sunlight that falls on the vineyard. For this reason, some of the best wines come from vineyards planted on quite steep hills, conditions which would make most other agricultural products uneconomic. The stereotypical vineyard site for wine grapes in the Northern Hemisphere is a hillside in a dry climate with a southern exposure, good drainage to reduce unnecessary water uptake, and balanced pruning to force the vine to put more of its energy into the fruit rather than foliage. Last summer, Hillier and I were in Germany to speak at a conference of missionaries from throughout the Middle East, and they came to Germany together for their conference. And we, we were staying, the place where the conference was held was in the Lahn Valley. The River Lahn flows down quite a steep valley along the uh, bottom of the valley uh, and ends up in the Rhine, the mighty Rhine, it joins it at Koblenz. And on either side of the Lahn River were these steep hills covered with vineyards. I wondered how they worked those vineyards. You 
probably couldn't get any machinery up there or down from the top. It was, it was very steep. But they were in that position, exposed to sunlight. And uh, where from the sunlight, they draw what is required to create the best grapes as opposed to from the ground. And there's several interesting things there. You know, the difficult terrain is good for the vine. This man built his vineyard on the hillside and he cleared the stones so at least the roots could go down and hold into the soil. The nutrition is often not good in, on the hillside because of uh, the water washing it down and erosion uh, taking away the topsoil. But exposed to the sun, they would receive the best uh, ingredient for making the best wine, apparently. Everything was conducive to a good harvest. God's purpose for us is he puts us in that environment that creates fruit and harvest. This is my Father's glory, said Jesus in John 15, verse 8, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to me, be my disciples. Now, if that's the purpose of the vineyard, to produce fruit, let me talk a second about the problem with the vineyard, because this vineyard, where he looked for good fruit, discovered only bad fruit. When I looked for the good grapes, he says in verse 4, why did it yield only bad? In the second song in chapter 27, he says, I watched over it, I water it continue. I guard it day and night, and no one may harm it. God says, I am fighting here to make the plant fruitful, that the branch produces fruit. And yet, it doesn't seem to happen. I talked last week about the fact that God does not force his will. If God had created a world where everything happened exactly according to his plan, it would not be a world in which we would love God. You cannot force love. It would be a world in which we had to do things because we were programmed to do things and predetermined to do things and we could not respond in love. That's why, as I said last week, that so much of what God has done seems to go wrong when he created the angelic world in the beginning before creating the earth. He created angels and Amongst those angels was Lucifer, the most beautiful of all God's angels, and he rebelled against God and led a rebellion where up to a third of the angels of heaven were driven out of heaven because of their rebellion. <laughs> of course, God could have forced obedience. He could have programmed them only to obey, but they would not love him when he made the human race placed Adam and Eve together in that beautiful garden where everything they needed was theirs. But you remember how they disobeyed and they fell and the fall took place. The whole human race fell in Adam. Could God have programmed them not to have fallen? Yes, but they would not have loved him. We can program Things to happen exactly as we want, but we don't get a spontaneous response of love. When God set Israel apart as his nation and drew them to himself, that he might love them and they might love him, they too went quickly away from the path God had planned for them. And here you have them as a fruitless Vineyard is the picture. God is love. That's his nature. 
And as love, he loves and he looks for that reciprocation of love. He created us for a love relationship with him. And that love relationship, by definition, cannot be forced. It cannot be pre-programmed. Otherwise, it would not be love. And if it was, it wouldn't mean anything. As I said last week, I can program my computer to start up every morning saying, good morning, Charles, I love you. So what? That won't impress me after a while. <laughs> but my wife says it spontaneously, and when my kids might send me a text that says it, what do you think that means to me? Of course it does, because it is freely given. And therefore God, by very nature, can only create a creation that is possible of falling and failing. So we might have a love relationship with him. And our fruitlessness and our failings derive from one thing, that we become detached and separate from God. We're out of that relationship with God. As Isaiah writes later, Isaiah 59 verse 2, your iniquities have separated you from your God and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. There's a breakdown in your relationship with God. Why? Because your sin, your independence, your arrogance, your willfulness, your disobedience, your iniquities have separated you. Your sins have hidden him from you. Why are you and I not fruitful? Why often do we find our Christian lives don't seem to move and don't seem to grow because we are not developing that relationship? We're not spending time alone with God in his word, in prayer, listening to him, letting him speak deep into our hearts and deepen that awareness of his presence and that love for him and that responsiveness to him. It's the easiest thing in the world to be busy but to leave God aside no time just to nurture that relationship. It doesn't work in a marriage when you do that. We're so busy, no time to stop and look at each other and talk to each other and listen to each other and just be together. If you've no time for that, you've not got a very rich marriage. It's when we're open and vulnerable and kind and caring and your spouse knows you're more important than all the other demanding things that are on your back all the time. And making time with God, because I am sure one of the smartest tactics of the devil is to keep us distant from God. That's what's happening to Israel. So if the purpose of the vineyard is to produce fruit, and the problem with the vineyard is that you become distant from me. And the bad fruit, therefore, is the lack of justice, the lack of righteousness, the lack of holiness, the lack of these qualities that would be fruitful. And the third thing is the purifying of the vineyard. What is God going to do about this? He's the gardener. He's the farmer. He's the one who owns the vineyard. What he says in chapter 5, verse 5, now I'll tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge and it will be destroyed. I will break down its wall and it will be trampled. I'll make a wasteland neither pruned nor cultivated and briars and thorns will grow there. Now that's a very interesting statement. What he's saying there is this. Okay, what am I going to do? I'm just going to just take my hands off it. I'll take the wall down. I'll let those branches go any way they want to go. I'll let briars and thorns grow, weeds grow in the vineyard. Now, in the following verses, that is exactly what happens. We talked about in the last couple of weeks. We talked about the fact, in the words of Paul in Romans 1, which we applied to some of these chapters in Isaiah, God gave them over to the sins of their own choice. Okay, you want to live detached from me? Let me let you go to the logical end of this. And you find yourself in a position where the natural end of our disobedience and our sin produces fruit that is bad and dangerous. But he does this not to say, well, just do your own thing. And that's 
I'll take my hands off. He's saying, I'll let you do your own thing until it brings you to the place where you realize this is totally non-productive and non-fruitful. Where you realize my life is in a mess. You know, the wise father of the prodigal son, when his son came and said, give me my share of the money, let me go off on my own. Fathers know their sons. He knew that boy is going to be in a pig pen within six months. Fathers know that. You know what your kids are like. It's probably where he's going to end up. And off he goes, but the father starts looking because when that boy hits the pig pen, that's when he'll come home. That's when I get my son back. You know, God lets us go. I'm going to let this vine spread everywhere. By the way, vines just move along the ground. You've got to prop them up. You've got to have stakes to hold them in position to produce good fruit. Down on the ground, they don't produce good fruit. That's why you stake them up and you wire them up and you hold them up. I'm going to let this thing just go. And in Hosea, he talks about Israel was a spreading vine that brought fruit for himself. That is of no use to God, just his own satisfaction. But the next chapters describe in Isaiah from chapter 5 through to where he comes back to this song in chapter 27 and sees something that's fruitful. He talks about Israel going through turmoil and destruction and coming to that point of spiritual and moral bankruptcy. In chapter 5, verse 8 on there, he talks about the sins of Israel that are going to break them and prevent them. This is part of the chastisement of God. And then when the vine begins to realize this is not producing anything, he is going to get a whole blood vine and he's going to prune it. He's going to discipline it. He's going to bring it back into a position of being fruitful. Jesus talked about that in John 15, verse 1, I am the vine, my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. Well, every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it will be even more fruitful. I know some people read that and wonder if that means that if you're a Christian, he'll cut you off and you lose your salvation. He's talking about every branch in me that bears no fruit. You can be in Christ, but not fruit bearing. And what he's going to do is bring his shears to prune that branch. And if you're a branch that is bearing fruit, he is still going to prune it to make it even more fruitful. See, pruning forces the vine to put more of its energy into the fruit than it does into the foliage. And if we're not pruned, we can be full of foliage and we look quite healthy, but there's no fruit. That's why Jesus, in the week before he was crucified, came into Jerusalem and found this time it was a fig tree and it was, it was uh, full of leaves and it obviously looked a beautiful tree because the disciples were offended when Jesus looked at the tree and although it was full of leaves, it had no fruit, he cursed it. And the next day when they came by, it had withered to nothing. And they said, what was he doing? Because it was all foliage, no fruit. And his purpose is to produce fruit and therefore he prunes and disciplines. As he goes on to say later in, in, in John 15, verse 4, remain in me, I remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you're the branches. If a man remains in me, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And if anyone does not remain in me, he's like a branch that is thrown away and withers, and such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned, simply because there is no secondary use for a vine other than producing grapes. You can't make furniture out of a vine. There's no alternative use for it. All it's good for is being thrown into the fire. 
Because unless you are bearing fruit, he says, ultimately, the value that should derive from your life is lost. If you don't abide in me, live in union with me, in fellowship with me, in dependence on me, in love with me, in obedience to me, all these things are included in abiding in him, then you will produce no fruit. No fruit. I wonder what we know about the pruning of the gardener. What we know about the discipline of God in our lives. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5, the writer says, Have you forgotten that word of encouragement that addresses you as sons? My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. The father role of God in our lives includes disciplining in order to prune us. He goes on to say, endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. What son is not disciplined by his father? If you're not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you're illegitimate children. You're not true sons. Moreover, we all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of our spirits and live? Our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who've been trained by it. That's in Hebrews 12. It produces a harvest. What is a harvest? It's about fruit. It produces fruit. And he's saying there, that God in his wisdom will often lead us into troubled waters, into difficult times, or use those difficult times as they occur in our lives to discipline us and prune us. That the fruit, which is the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the character of Christ, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. In Galatians 5.22, Paul talks about fruit that is going to come from our lives. The character of the Lord Jesus Christ will come through hardships, through difficulties, through tears. There is a very superficial understanding of the Christian life that says that God's role in our lives is to take us out of our difficulties. You get a problem, ask God, get rid of it. No, maybe that problem is a gift from God. Maybe that difficulty is a gift from God. Maybe there are things in your life that keep you dependent on him. And that has become a gift from God to produce what is far better than your comfort and our comfort. It is his character, his fruit. And fruit, by definition, is for eating. It brings benefit to other people and blessing to other people. Talks in... The Psalms about you put my tears in your bottle. God keeps our tears in his bottle, not because he's morbid, but because those tears are precious to him, because he knows those tears often represent the place where God in his love and kindness has pruned us, where he has disciplined us, where hardship has produced the fruit of righteousness and peace. You know, when we look at that list, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, you know, it, it, it's not just a, a list of cute little phrases. When you find these in people, they've often been produced by tough times and hard times and painful times, and tearful circumstances. Some of this discipline of God is by our own making, because we disobeyed him. That's what Israel had done. He talks about, in chapter 27, 
about leading them into warfare and difficulties. And he talks about the blast of a fierce east wind will sweep the map. That's a picture of Babylon coming in from the east and taking them off into exile. And in that exile, God disciplined them and they rediscovered again something they had lost. They rediscovered a relationship with God. So when they came back, the first thing they did under Ezra's leadership was rebuild the temple where they could reconnect again with God and stay in touch with God. God will often bring us to that point where we have no choice but to call out to him and cry out to him. That's a wonderful place to be at. You know, sometimes we're never closer to God than when we're coming with our sin and we are confessing it and we're experiencing his forgiveness and we're experiencing his grace and that sin, bad though it is, separating us from God though it does. When we come back, like the sun coming home from the pig pen, that embrace was probably one of the closest moments he'd ever known with his father. Don't bury your sin, confess it. Let's not bury those things that have gone wrong, those things that are breaking us. Let's bring them into the open. Let's confess them. Let's allow him to forgive us and cleanse us. Let's bring all the difficulties of our lives that God has allowed into our lives that we may see in them the kind hand of a father who loves us and who disciplines us, the kind hand of the gardener who prunes us that we may bear more fruit. Not that we lose a few leaves, but that we bear more fruit. That's why he's doing it. And the picture Isaiah is giving in these two chapters, it's going back to this picture of Israel as the vineyard. He's done everything to make it productive, but when he looked for good fruit, there was no good fruit. And so then he goes, takes them to a dark tunnel of more than 20 chapters where they experience the chastisement and the judgment of God, and they come out in that day, says Isaiah, there is a fruitful vineyard because the chastisement of God has worked its purpose. I don't know where you are. I don't know what's happening in your life. I don't know where you may sense or see the pruning, the chastisement of God. If you have the will of God, he'll give you every opportunity to come back in by the circumstances he brings in your life. If you are bearing fruit, he'll want even more fruit. He'll prune you for better fruit. As somebody said to me after the first service, so you're pruned if you do and you're pruned if you don't. <laughs> I said, that's true, actually. Why? Don't look at the pruning, look at the fruit. That's what it's about. Better fruit, more fruit. I'm going to read you a poem. It is anonymous. I read it about five years or so ago, and I'm going to read it to you again. I read it here about five years ago. It's called, When God Wants a Man. When God wants to drill a man and thrill a man and skill a man, when God wants to mold a man to play the noblest parts, when he yearns with all his heart to create so great and bold a man that all the world shall praise, watch his methods, watch his ways, how he ruthlessly perfects whom he royally elects, how he hammers him and hurts him and with mighty blows converts him into frail shapes of clay that only God understands, how his tortured heart is crying and he lifts beseeching hands, how he bends but never breaks when his good he undertakes, how he uses whom he chooses and with every purpose fuses him, by every art induces him to try his splendor out God knows what he's about. When God wants to take a man and shake a man and wake a man, when God wants to make a man to do the Father's will, when he yearns with all his soul to create him large and whole, see what cunning he prepares him, how he goads and never spares him, how he wets him and he frets him, and in poverty begets him, 
how often he disappoints whom he sacredly anoints. With what wisdom he will hide him, never minding what betide him, makes him lonely so that only God's high messages shall reach him, so that he may surely teach him what his heavenly father planned. When God wants to name a man, and fame a man and tame a man, when God wants to shame a man to do his heavenly will, when he tries the highest test that his reckoning may bring, how he reigns him and restrains him so his body scarce contains him while he fires him and inspires him, keeps him yearning, ever burning for that tantalizing goal, lures and lacerates his soul, sets a challenge for his spirit, draws it highest, then he's near it, makes a jungle that he clear it, makes a desert that he fear it, and subdue it if he can. That's how God does make a man. Then to test his spirit's wrath, he'll throw a mountain in his pass, put a bitter choice before him, and relentlessly stand o'er him. Climb or perish, so he says, but watch his purpose, watch his ways. God's plan is wondrously kind. Could we understand his mind? Fools are they who call him blind, when his feet are torn and bleeding, yet his spirit mounts unheeding, blazing newer paths and finds. Lo the crisis, lo the shouts that would call the leader out. When the people need salvation, does he rise to lead the nation? Then does God show his plan, and the world has found a man. That's what it takes to make a person fruitful. That God disciplines and prunes that we may bear more fruit. And that's because God loves you and loves me. This parable about Israel is a parable about Christian living. Where I, said Jesus, am the true vine. And you are the branches. And you abide in me and I in you. You'll bear much fruit. And my Father will prune you, the branch, to make you even more fruitful. Let's thank him for his wisdom. Thank him for his hand in your life at the moment. Whatever that may involve, whether it's comfortable or difficult, Thank him. He is bringing something out of this that will be not only eternally significant, but make you so much richer and more fruitful. Let's pray together. And we'll have just a moment of quiet. Maybe you need to just talk to him and respond to him. With honesty and openness, Lord, what are you doing in my life to make me more fruitful? Lord, I thank you for every person in this building this morning. For those of us who know you, we've been brought into a relationship with you. We thank you for that. For those of us who don't, we pray that you'll bring us into that living relationship with you. Whereby you cleanse us of our past. You make us a new person. The old has gone, the new has come. And that new is to be fruitful, that we might be fruitful in bringing blessing and benefit to other people as your character of kindness and love and goodness and justice and righteousness is expressed through us. Write this deeply into our hearts, we pray. Thank you for loving us so much that you'll chastise us to make us fruitful. We thank you in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Amen.